Hello, this is Miss Augustine, and today we are going to learn a little bit about writing names and formulas for ionic compounds. And this is going to be an intro. So for starters, let's remind ourselves what chemical bonding is. And chemical bonding is that mutual electrical attraction that occurs between the nuclei and valence electrons of different atoms, and it's what binds them together. And remember, the valence electrons are the outermost electrons, so we're talking about um, electrons in the S and P sublevels. And there are two types of bonding that we learned about, ionic bonding, which consists of metal and nonmetal bonding, and the electrons are transferred, not shared. So the metal typically loses the electrons and the nonmetal gains them. Whereas with covalent bonding, it's nonmetal to nonmetal bonding, and the electrons are shared between two or more atoms. So with ionic bonding, the ionic compound is really composed of anions and cations, and they're combined so that the numbers of positive and negative charges are equal. And that's because atoms are going to do what they need to do to get to a stable octet, to get to a low energy state. So what's going to happen is they're going to rearrange themselves such that everybody gets what they need. And it's important to understand that cations are positively charged ions. How do you remember that? Well, you can say that cat ions are positive, positive, because cats have paws. Or you can notice that there is a plus sign in the middle of the word cation. So cations are the positive charged ions. Anions are negatively charged. And so I like to point out that anions are negative. Again, it's important to keep that straight. So two examples would be calcium chloride and sodium chloride. So how do we represent ionic compounds? We use something called a formula unit. So we can't write a molecular formula because no molecules are formed. Remember, we've got collections of anions and cations. So the formula unit represents the lowest whole number ratio of cations to anions in an ionic compound. And these compounds, again, are comprised of metal-nonmetal bonding. So the definition in your book states that ionic compounds exist as a collection of positively and negatively charged ions arranged in a three-dimensional pattern and that have a net charge of zero. And if we were in school together, I would pull up all my little examples of uh, models of what these things look like. Um, for our purposes, we're just going to have to remember that different substances have different 3D patterns. So ionic compounds are neutral. That means you're combining a cation and an anion, and the sum of the charges of your cation and your anion must end up to zero, so it is a neutral compound. Compounds are always neutral. If something has ion in its name, like sulfate ion or sodium ion, then you know it's got a charge. If it's a compound like sodium chloride or carbon dioxide or whatever, they're neutral. So compounds are neutral. That means that the plus and the minus add up, in this case, to zero. Plus one minus one equals zero. And we end up with a neutral compound. So the charge of the cation and anion have to add up to zero. So how do we figure out ionic charges? So for the main group elements, they always form cations and we can go through the groups and figure it out. So it's really easy for the main group metals. Their charge is whatever group number they are in with a plus sign. So if you are in the main group one, which is the alkali metals, your charge would be plus one. So lithium, sodium, potassium, and so forth all have a charge of plus one. If we're talking about the main group two elements, again, vertical columns in the periodic table all the way over on the left, group two are the so-called alkaline earth metals, and they all have a charge of plus two, so magnesium, calcium, and so forth. If you are in main group 13 or 3, and again, it depends on your periodic table, it's either 3A or 13, for those metals, and again, we're coming up in that portion of the periodic table in the P block, you're coming up to that line of demarcation. So the metals that are main group in that region 
um, and again for 13 you would drop the 1 so it would be group 3 then its charge would be plus 3 so group number with a positive sign and really the only uh, main group metal over in the P block that we're going to talk about a great deal would be aluminum and again charge is plus 3 so what about the charge for the main group nonmetals? So the main group nonmetals, the charge is determined by subtracting 8 from the group number. So nonmetals go negative, and nonmetals form negative ions. And the easiest way to do it is to subtract 8 from their group number. So for example, if you're talking about group 17 all the way over on the far right, and you can think of that as either 17 or 7a, depending on what periodic table you're looking at, its charge would be minus 1. So 7 minus 8 is negative 1. So everyone in group 17 forms a negative 1 ion. If we're talking about group 15, the nitrogen family, or 5A, um, its charge would be 5 minus 8, so it's negative 3. If we're talking about the oxygen family in group 16, or 6A, depending on the numbering, that would be 6 minus 8 is negative 2, so oxygen and sulfur, everyone in that column would form a negative 2. And in group 17, again, the halogen 17 or 7a, depending on the numbering system, 7 minus 8 is negative 1. So again, the charge of everyone in that column in the halogens would be negative 1. For group 18 or 0, depending on your, uh, your periodic table, or group 14 or 4a, they usually do not form ions. So 18 are the noble gases and they don't need to form compounds and group 14 or 4a is the carbon family they're nonmetals that typically form molecular compounds so again if carbon were to form an ion it would be 4 minus 8 so its charge would be negative 4 but generally speaking they don't typically form ionic compounds so the other thing we have to talk about is what about all those metals in the middle of the periodic table? And those are the so-called transition metals and some of the heavy metals. Something called the stock system is used. So for naming cations, because they can form more than one possible ion, and with just a few exceptions, those metals in the D block and the heavy metals in the bottom of the P block, they all form more than one ion. And so we have to have a way to tell us whether it's the plus 2 or the plus 3 or the plus 1 and plus 2. So we use something called the stock system. So for example with iron, it has two possibilities, iron 2 or iron 3. So we use Roman numerals. So we have to trot out the Romans every now and then. And so the Roman numerals are used to denote the charge. So iron 2 has a charge of plus 2 and iron 3 has a charge of plus 3 and you'll notice there's a specific way that we write that we use a capital Roman numeral and it is in parentheses next to the metal that it's talking about so there's exceptions two exceptions that we want you to memorize silver always forms a plus 1 ion and zinc always forms a plus 2 and because those guys only form the one ion, we do not use a Roman numeral. So do not use a Roman numeral for silver or zinc. And remember, silver is always plus one, zinc is always plus two. So we can also use the root word with a suffix to designate between different cations. And this is the older system before the stock system was adopted in, I want to say, the 70s. And so that system for instance, for iron 2, it was called ferrous ion, and iron 3 was the ferric. So you'd have ferrous sulfate versus ferric sulfate, or ferrous oxide versus ferric. The problem with that system is that you had to remember what the possible ions were for each particular metal, and then you had to remember that the us ending is used for the lower charged ion, and the ick is used for the higher. So three is a bigger number, so you use the ick. Two is a smaller number, you use the us. And again, fortunately, nobody uses that system anymore. You'll see it still occasionally on a bottle of chemicals, but typically speaking, we don't use that system anymore.
So some other ions that we have to talk about are the so-called polyatomic ions. And these are ions that are made up of more than one atom. So they're actually covalently bonded atoms. They're covalently bonded together, but they have a net charge, so they are ions. They behave like a single atom. They're very tightly bonded. They're very common and extremely stable in nature. And they all have special names. And that's why on our common ions sheet, it is smart to memorize the group five and six ions because they come up a lot. So sulfate ion is SO4 minus two, and nitrate is NO3 minus one. So most contain oxygen, they're called oxyanions, and those end in ite or eight. And exceptions are ammonium, NH4+, plus, hydroxide, OH-, minus, and cyanide. So these three do not have that ite eight ending. And there is another group of them, polyatomic ions, that begin with a hydrogen and they are a combination of a hydrogen ion with another ion, and so the charge of that net ion is the sum of the two ions. So for instance, for the hydrogen carbonate ion, the charge is H plus plus CO3, two minus, so the overall charge is a negative one. So for now, this is Ms. Augustine signing off.